Welcome back to day two of the Global Philanthropy, Philanthropy Forum and to this plenary that's entitled Leveraging Market Systems for Good, Transforming Global Supply Chains and Protecting Those Within. My name is Randy Newcomb. I'm the President and CEO of Humanity United. I'll be the moderator for this session. Humanity United, by the way, is one of the um, uh, foundations of the Omidyar Group, which represents the philanthropic and professional interests of Pam and Pierre Omidyar. If we have people joining us today from the web audience, uh, if you're live tweeting, we want to encourage lots of tweeting. And uh, the tweeting, though, should be done at hashtag GPF15. So if you're all looking at your uh, phones during this presentation, I know that you'll be tweeting to hashtag GPF15. I hope you enjoyed the first day of yesterday's conference. As you heard from Jane yesterday, this year's conference is focused on global challenges that require the commitment of the philanthropic, private, and public sectors and coordination among all of them. Yesterday, President Jim Young Kim of the World Bank started the conference by challenging all of us to do our part in eradicating poverty and increasing shared pros prosperity. We also discussed the complex challenges associated with crisis situations and the critical importance of cross-sector coordination in these scenarios. And last night, my very good friends, Mo and Hadil Ibrahim, uh, didn't fail us to not be provocative. Uh, they highlighted the critical importance of leadership and governance structures that are transparent, accountable, and committed to equity among all. We also had the opportunity yesterday, after, yesterday afternoon to dive deeper on, onto a number of different topics during the working group sessions in the afternoon. Some of you have may have attended my colleague, uh, Ed Markham, who uh, facilitated a session entitled Eradicating Slavery Supply Chains. I thought it was interesting that, that during Ed's uh, talk, one of the key themes that came out of that talk among uh, some 50 participants that were a part of that was again this theme around the importance of data. Uh, but there was also quite a bit of conversation around issues around the kind of quantity, the kind of quality of data that's available to us. And I think perhaps even during today's uh, plenary session, we'll be addressing these issues of uh, data, as did Mo last night. Before I invite our panelists to come up to the platform, I want to make a few just opening comments to frame the topic uh, this morning. As many of you know, today, tens of millions of adults and children are living in conditions of modern-day slavery around the world, often exploited into their situations through uh, force, through fraud or coercion. Some estimates of slaves around the world are at 36 million people. Many of us relate or understand this issue because we're learning more about the sex trade and or sex sl slavery, or perhaps we recently read an article about a domestic worker trafficked into the country working for no pay. Last night, uh, Mo pointed to this 20-meter, uh, 60-foot cargo vessel uh, that sank uh, just this last week in the Mediterranean. Uh, almost 800 people died, all of them being trafficked from North Africa looking for opportunity in Europe. So this is a current issue that we face and we see daily. In our increasingly globalized pan uh, planet, the goods we use and consume are often produced far more, uh, far from where they are bought, successfully changing hands along complex and opaque supply chains. It is within these supply chains that forced and child labor exists with well-documented with well documented abuses through the production process. At Humanity United, over the last five years, we've invested roughly $50 million to address modern-day slavery. Much of our work over this time has been focused on engaging corporations in this fight, with the notion that global business has, unique, has a unique opportunity and also a compelling responsibility to understand and guard against labor issues and labor abuses within their supply chains and to meaningfully contribute to the eradication of modern-day slavery. Today we have what, what I believe are really four of the world's top experts on supply chains, labor abuses, and modern-day slavery. And I'm really happy, and I thank Jane for giving us the opportunity to extend this conversation into the Global Philanthropy Forum community. Joining us today are leaders that, have that we at Humanity United have supported and worked with on this issue over the years. Stella Dawson is the Chief Correspondent on Governance and Anti-Corruption for the Thomson Reuters Foundation. She led Reuters' global coverage of financial crises between 2007 and 2010, and has reported on the dot-com crash, the Asia currency crisis, and the internet productivity boom. 
Justin Dillon is the founder and CEO of Made in the Free World, a nonprofit dedicated to ending forced labor, human trafficking, and modern day slavery. In 2008, he directed the film Call and Response, which was released widely in theaters across the country and focused on the vast quantity of slaves in modern society. Nina Smith is the executive director of Good Weave International, a nonprofit committed to ending child labor and other forms of modern slavery in the carpet industry. A fair trade advocate and expert for two decades, Nina is also an advocate for children's rights and an expert on addressing labor rights violations in manufacturing supply chains. Then finally, my good friend Dan Viederman is the CEO of Verite, a nonprofit that works with corporations to ensure better labor conditions for workers around the world. For this work, Dan was awarded a Skoll Foundation Award for Social Entrepreneurship in 2007. So as our panelists come to the platform, let's give them a welcoming applause. So since this is the uh, this this is the the, the global philanthropy forum, I, I thought I wanted to open our conversation this morning with a big global question, uh, something that does justice to the global philanthropy forum community. So here's a big global question that I'm going to put out there, and and you may or you may not uh, want to answer it, or you may not even agree with me, uh, but we're going to go big uh, to start this off. So here's my, here's my question, let me frame it up for all of us. So, we can track the cotton in our garments to the actual field it was grown. My son has a pair of jeans that has a little label on the back that says where the cotton in his jeans were grown in the, in the particular field. So we know we can track cotton. We can know with a level of confidence that our technology devices are free of conflict minerals. We can guarantee that diamonds aren't used to fund militia and to buy weapons. And we have visibility into the fields our produce has grown and the actual date it was harvested. However, we can't seem to determine if slaves, men, women, and children were used to make and manufacture our everyday consumer products. What on heaven's name <laughs> is going on here that we can track all of these other transactions and processes, but when it comes to young children, to men and women, used as slaves, we can't determine if the everyday products that we used were used by these individuals. Somebody help me understand that. You want me to jump in? <laughs> jump right in, Stella. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a very optimistic way in which you framed it, the fact that there's some products you can track that cotton. There are companies that are tracking the conflict minerals. But talk to Carolyn Durland, who's right here, she, and thank you. <laughs> I'll be talking later today. The difficulty in doing that and the amount of time it takes is absolutely huge. But more important than that is... I do not see sufficient political will at the heads of corporations, let alone in the countries, for that type of work to be done. And until that changes, you won't have conflict-free mineral products. You will not have genes that have uh, not harvested by people in fields in Uzbekistan under slave labor conditions. There has to be more political will and leadership in order for that to happen at the corporate board level. Justin, yeah. uh, you're working on a product right now that um, is helping to address this question. Yeah, I mean, basically, I'll talk about that, but I really believe that it is a, the confluence of will and way to be able to change this. It's not one or the other. I think that we have to be able to create the political will, the consumer will, and even the will in the marketplace to be able to make these changes and make the investments to look at this. And it is about data. What we see often is that companies are saying, well, we don't know where the problem is, and so therefore there's no culpability or, or, or responsibility is maybe a better way to say it. I think all of us on this panel know that there's by no means great data out there, but there's enough to get started. And I think that part of what we have to get over is that you have to be perfect to begin 
this process. And so we created a, a, a database of everything that you can buy or sell on the marketplace to give you a starting point to understand where slavery might be touching your supply chain. Great. Dan. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> um, I, I mean, to, to understand what is happening to very vulnerable people who are by definition hidden in supply chains is to, uh, is to force ourselves to reckon with turning upside down the basic business model of globalization, which is corporate disintegration and out, constant outsourcing. So an example, we did some work for a company that had a sort of an iconic uniform that they used. It was really kind of represented their, their company. And we found out that it was, it was made in Bangladesh, it was a garment, but it traveled through literally nine different hands, business hands, between the order that was placed and the, and the, and the manufacturing of the garment. I mean, it is routine for garment companies to design a good or, or a, some, some form piece of clothing and place it in the hands of an agent whose responsibility it is to do everything from finding the factories, placing the raw material, ensuring the quality, and monitoring the working conditions. Um, in the electronics sector, these big electronics brands that we all know and whose products we love rely on original equipment manufacturers who are massive multi-billion dollar companies who you've never heard of, and they outsource their hiring and their human resources to labor brokers. So you have this completely sort of disintegrated outsourced model that has become almost exponential. Um, and to get to the really vulnerable people at the bottom of that economic system requires a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. I think it, there's, there's no doubt we all represent ways in which it can be done, but the political will, the corporate will is still anecdotal, and the examples you brought up at the beginning, I think, are, are places where that has, where, where the political will and, and capability has coalesced, um, but they are still the exception rather than the rule. Mm. Nina, let me frame this a little bit differently for you. Um, You've played such a leadership role in the South Asia carpet industry. And um, I, I recall, I think it was two years ago when we visited one of the factories uh, that you've had such a significant influence in. We, uh, it, it, it unfortunately happened to be a day in Kathmandu when the Maoist political party called a strike. And so all the workers didn't show up, and, uh, but we got to sit with the manager f uh, for a couple of hours and talk about uh, labor issues within this factory, which actually turned out to be a really, uh, really interesting conversation. Can you illuminate for us the specific labor concerns in, in, the, in the carpet industry and how you're working uh, with businesses to address the eradication of slavery? Okay. Well, um, there are 168 million children documented to be working in the global economy today, and Goodweave was founded to really create a market-driven model to tackle that problem starting in the South Asian carpet industry. So the kinds of problems you might see are um, child trafficking, children that are hundreds of miles away from their home village, um, trapped in a, a small workshop, possibly in a factory, um, away from their families, um, bonded labor, workers that um, have taken loans from employers just to meet their basic everyday needs, forced labor, um, gross underpayment of wages. So these are the kinds of things we're seeing. Sometimes, um, sometimes there is local family labor, um, but oftentimes we're seeing, um, seeing children that are being trafficked to fill these jobs. So those are the kinds of conditions. Um, a, a report came out not long ago called Tainted Carpets by Siddharth Kara of Harvard, who's um, also a leading expert on these issues. Um, and he also drew the linkage um, that um, in, in, in this report that 99% of cases of um, forms of modern slavery are linked to the lowest caste people, for example, in India, where he did his report. So you're dealing with ethnic minorities, um, migrants, and, um, and um, very low caste, vulnerable people. So um, in terms of how we're working to tackle this problem, uh, we've been working for uh, 20 years. This is our 20-year anniversary. And um, we have, um, we have a, what I said, a, a market-driven model. We call it market-driven because it works when companies partner with us. 
Um, we have a, a certification program that a, uh, a company can license. Um, that's the critical moment because when, when we partner with a company, they agree to open up their entire supply chains in the countries where we work in India, Nepal, and Afghanistan. Um, and what's unique about the way that we uh, work with them is we have local NGOs in country that, uh, with um, experienced trained teams that do inspection and monitoring of their supply chains at all levels. So um, not just at a factory level, but at all subcontracted levels, um, literally down to villages and into homes. And that's really key in all of this. So the big impact comes from the deterrent effect of a producer knowing that at any time someone from our team could show up um, and the threat that if they're found with a violation, they could um, lose their um, access to these buyers that are placing orders with them. Um, some other things that we do um, on the ground, uh, if we find children in supply chains, we remove them, we rescue them, we provide them near-term rehabilitation and long-term support for their education. And we have a range of prevention programs in the community. So um, our programs work all along the supply chain, literally from consumers raising awareness about the certification label um, that's on the back of the carpet that they can demand at the point of purchase, um, to working with brands to get them engaged in this effort, uh, all the way down to worker communities and victims. You know, th uh, Stella, I want to come back to you because we there has been quite a bit of um, awareness, particularly around the carpet industry, and some growing awareness on uh, commodities and, and uh, garments and, and otherwise. You've been in a, a really unique position sort of reporting on these uh, trends and uh, as well as kind of commenting on public policy concerns and issues. But there's still some gaps that exist within, uh, within this. And talk to us about your work and where you think the, exact, uh, the, the gaps exist in this reporting work that you're engaged in. Yeah, I think we, there has been increasing <laughs> amounts of reporting. We know about uh, the shrimp industry in Thailand, and then that, those problems moving increasingly to Bangladesh. Now I'm hearing more uh, parts of Latin America, um, forced labor in the shrimp, shrimp industry, brick factories in India, um, cotton fields in Uzbekistan, construction in Dubai. I, these are well reported. But Nina said probably one of the most important things with regard to where you find slavery and it is those most vulnerable people who have very few opportunities, who are displaced, who may be a lowest in the social class, um, or here in the United States, it's usually runaway girls who end up being trafficked into prostitution. So whenever you have poor, disenfranchised, marginalized people, there is the opportunity for slavery. So where do I see uh, potential for some additional cases? I think right now Syrian refugees is particularly vulnerable on an area that certainly we at the foundation are starting to look at. And uh, indeed also in West Africa with the three countries, Liberia, Guinea, and uh, Sierra Leone, so badly hit by the Ebola crisis, there too you've got pools of people who weren't able to go out into their fields or the children who've lost their parents who again are extremely vulnerable at this particular moment. So I think there's sectoral gaps and we as journalists will continue to report on those when we're able to adequately document and uh, uh, support those stories. Um, but I think the other gap is less sectoral and more conceptual, um, and it's about the responsibility and accountability. And I think there needs to be a much more deepened conversation around business responsibility for human rights. It's in its relatively early stages. We have a number of corporations who are doing extremely good jobs. Um, there are uh, global principles such as the UN business human rights principles and the Rugi, Rugi principles. Uh, but the degree to which uh, corporate America certainly has embedded the idea that it must 
be responsible throughout its supply chain, and that this is a risk not merely because consumers might not want to buy their products anymore, but they are corporate citizens, and they have to dig deeper in order to make sure that they're not violating the human rights of other people. That I do not see either very well covered, reported on, or corporations held to account. And frankly, I find it quite shocking when I go to the US District Court when uh, the conflict minerals legislation that the United States Congress passed, called, known as Dodd-Frank Section 1502, was being litigated by the US Chamber of Commerce and the, the mining industry. And one of the most preeminent law firms in the country steps up there and says, it is against the First Amendment rights of a corporation to report on whether this conflict minerals in their supply chain. That shows you, and the judge was sympathetic, moreover, <laughs> that shows you that a lot of work has yet to be done. No, I, I agree. I, I, obviously, there's so much more work to be done, but it does feel like something's happening uh, within public policy as a response to the need for more work. We look at California 657, the, the, um, the <coughs> California Transparency and Supply Chains Act. Two years ago, President Obama's executive order on procurement, and then just recently, the UK's Modern Slavery Act. I spoke with some of our policy folks last night, and they told me at the end of 2014, there was 25 some odd resolutions and bills working their way through Congress. So, so it, Something's happening, you know, that's catching the attention of uh, uh, certainly on the public policy side. But just to challenge you a little bit, don't you think that's going to push uh, for more of the response on the corporate side, or will they continue to flee into the shadows? Oh, I absolutely think that that type of uh, legislation that's up on Capitol Hill right now, the number of hearings that are being held, the more and more cases that are reported by us in the news media, uh, the more advocacy that's done by the NGOs and the consumer behavior, this all cumulatively works. I, I have absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but corporations are extraordinarily powerful. And uh, as, as Dan was saying, when you're talking about the complexity of the modern global system, where they're accessing products from all over the world, these multinational companies, they're bigger in terms of their uh, annual revenues than the GDP of the countries in which they operate. So they act as they have a, they have a quasi, um, they have a status that's much greater than a nation state in many, many parts of the world. So if you're not attacking it there, the number of rules and regulations you pass and the amount you turn to the actual country where this is happening and saying, you've got to do something about your labor laws is going to be limited because multinationals are so significant in the impact that they can have. So that mindset has got to continue to change. Thank you. Justin, I'm going to turn to you a moment to talk about some of your emphasis on developing tools around risk analysis. So cue this one up, OK? But Dan, I'm going to pivot to you right now. And I was reminded yesterday by Susan Davis from BRAC that two years ago tomorrow, April 24th, 2013, Bangladesh suffered their 9-11. Which, which was the collapse of the eight-story commercial building in the uh, Rana Plaza. Killed more than 1,100 workers, many of which were, uh, uh, it was all garment uh, workers, many of which were working in uh, slave-like or slave conditions. 2,500 people were injured. But as I read about it, just yesterday, The Guardian did really an interesting piece and uh, pointed to that, you know, it doesn't look like anything's really changed two years later. Some great work being done by Susan and others in terms of the victims' assistance funds and elsewhere. But with, in terms of the response on the corporate side, it, it looks limited, to be honest. Um, you challenge me on this, but you tell me, what do you see as the trends taking place now, even in the shadow of the Rana Plaza um, uh, disaster? Uh, so to speak just briefly about Rana Plaza, which is a very controversial issue in the, the the responses to which there are essentially two main responses to which I would challenge you. I think I think the responses have brought coalitions of companies together to set the stage for um, a very different 
uh, situation for workers in Bangladesh. There's, there's two competing initiatives, sort of competing initiatives. I think eventually they will come together. They have taken, I think, a very important, for both of them have taken very important first steps towards um, improving the safety of the structures that really drove the, 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 the initiative in the first place. When I, when I think about Rana Plaza, though, I think of something that's kind of more, more deeply tragic, in part because it's just sort of stupid, if you'll excuse my blunt language, right? Like, so those of us who've been working in and around Bangladesh were, were frankly not surprised that there was a, that there was some sort of disaster. When I see articles in the AP about slavery and Thai fishing that prompt reasonable responses from the companies involved, we're not surprised. When we see articles about slavery in other sectors, we're not surprised. The, the, there is information out there if you go looking for it, but the, the sort of the piece that just feels dumb to me is we continue to wait for crises to happen before we actually move. And maybe that's the nature of the human condition, and that's just we, we, those of us in the sort of change space need to just accept that and strategize around it in a way. But when I look at the question of slavery and supply chains, we collectively here and others in the audience and others outside this room represent solutions that could be adopted tomorrow and proven and would work. We can identify where the problems are, certainly at the geographic and sectoral level, as Justin has been doing, and, and even at the, at the level of the sort of individual supplier, as, as we and others have been doing. Um, it would be a shame if it continues to take us sort of lurching from crisis and disaster, from crisis to disaster to, to get there. So having now painted this kind of bleak and depressing picture, the fact that, as you mentioned, the federal government now requires any company selling its goods and services to the federal government to demonstrate in certain ways that it doesn't have slavery in its supply chain is a massive step forward. And it has driven companies to this issue in a way that nothing else has in my experience. Stella's absolutely right. It's mostly driven a lot of work for lawyers. Respect to all the lawyers in the world who, to, whose job it is to figure out how to comply. It, it, it's our job to make sure that it's not simply compliance. It's actually good practice against that. But the, the, at least some of these kind of crises and these, this increased awareness has now, has now led to a, a massive and very important public policy change, which means that multinationals, at least in the States and others who are trying to sell services to the U.S. government, are paying attention in a way they hadn't before. Just to, Stella, yes. to jump in very quickly, I think if you look at the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which was passed back in 1970, can't quite remember, <laughs> the late 70s, uh, you still have corporations today who are getting multi-billion dollar fines for violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, i.e. bribing a government official in another country in order to get a contract. You have to have enforcement you have to have commitment by corporations to do this. And that has not yet arrived on the supply chain issues. Human nature, you're absolutely right. Corporations are set up to make profits for their shareholders, so they want to minimize their costs. Uh, but until you have an enforcement mechanism where you're checking, just like with the FCPA, the US Justice Department is working to make examples of big corporations who are violating it, and then you know that this is bad news for me unless I really do have a very good checking system within the company. Well, so Justin, let's turn to that question then. You're, you're, you were just recently, last month or so, I think, Interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, uh, featured the work that you're doing in Made in a Free World, and um, and particularly around this this the development of these tools around risk analysis. And talk to us about how that uh, product is being received among the corporate community. Yeah, so we created, uh, you know, going back one step, you, part of what we need to be able to do is to demonstrate that there's will. And years ago, our organization created a, a website called Slavery Footprint that was meant for consumers to get an analysis, so to speak, on their own consumption. And uh, it was wildly successful, and we've seen over 23 million consumers come through it, and they all want to know who to buy from, and we don't have an answer. Um, which is, I'm an opportunity junkie, and that just drives me crazy to not be able to point in any, any particular direction with any confidence. So we then take, took that analysis that we did on the products for consumers and applied it to pretty much anything that can be bought and sold. And we started to bring this to businesses saying, is this, is this interesting? Because a few years ago, we did, a, we did a, a stakeholders meeting with some of the biggest companies in the world, and every one of them said, we need better optics, we need to know, we need some place to start. And quite frankly, and this is really important, 
we need a way to be able to tell the better story around this. Because when you start off with us as the villain, it's really hard to climb out of that hole and to talk about this publicly. So we've been thinking about the issue of slavery and supply chains in the rearview mirror. And we're not really thinking about it, about the purchases that are going to be made in the next five years by the, global, uh, by the, you know, the, the marketplace. So when we think about charity and when we think about the government being involved, there's a whole lot more money, upwards of $80 trillion, that's being played in the marketplace. We need to be thinking about those bags of money and how we're going to be able to leverage those to make behavior change further down in the supply chain. So we started with a database of all the goods, services, and commodities that exist, and now we're offering that to companies, and they're starting to use it, and there's a rule on our wall that came in a, uh, during a, a very um, fitful and stressful product development cycle in our office that says, tell me something I don't know. Our rule in our office is we're not allowed to sit down in front of a company unless we can tell them something they don't know. And every company that we sit down with, we're able to do that with this analysis. Fantastic. You know, it, uh, you probably saw this piece where Richard Branson uh, actually wrote, uh, he does a weekly um, little piece to all the Virgin uh, companies, some 200 companies within Virgin's companies, and he wrote about Justin's work and was asking the question all, of all the Virgin-related companies, what slaves are in our supply chain? Now, you've gotten Richard Branson, somebody who's an early adopter, and, uh, but I think that's a great sign, you know, that Absolutely. you've got somebody at that level asking the questions, kind of pointing to the products that um, you're beginning to develop. Nina, so 20 years on now, okay, you've seen it for a long time, like many of us have. What's your level of optimism? You've seen it close to the carpet industry, but how are you seeing the trends taking place within corporate, uh, the corporates around the world? Yeah, I mean, I'm just seeing a real snowball right now. It's, I think it is an incredible moment. So when we started our work, you know, the majority of our effort actually went into talking to companies and showing them the, the evidence of what's going on in their supply chains, trying to get them involved in this effort. But there was a real um, kind of limited interest really focused on small private businesses that were essentially morally motivated as business people. Um, and um, a few years back, we went through this uh, kind of learning and evaluation process to look at, you know, what what are going to be the signs that we're really having the kind of impact we want to have in the world, that we're getting to a tipping point in this industry and on this issue. And we said, it's when companies come to us. Mm. And... Um, um, they're coming to us. So at the end of last year, we just signed on Target Corporation, which is huge. They direct source their um, carpets from India and... Um we have a very close relationship with them. They're coming to the field. They're looking and learning. Um, so that's been incredible. And I think the consumer reach that they have is also going to make a difference for all of us. Um, and um, some other big companies like Restoration Hardware have been coming on board. The other thing that's been happening is um, dialogues with companies that don't work in the carpet industry that are asking us to adopt um, our work into new sectors. And we're actively working on that now. Now, so um, we have a major European apparel brand that we're working with to design a, a pilot to um, get to the um, informal workers in the in the apparel sector in India, um, and we have another um, pilot developing around the artisan sector. So. Uh, I think there's a huge amount of interest, and in, in, in the challenge is going to be, how do we pay for all this? Because yeah. um, right now, about we generate income from the, um, from the companies that we work with, and that covers about 20% of our budget globally. And so we charge a license fee, but there's only so much tolerance for what that cost can be to a company right now. And I think like the issue of sustainability is something that we all really need to look at. Like, what's the real cost of goods? If we if we want to buy goods that aren't made with slavery, we have to pay for it. Mm. So. Okay. Well, this is a good question here, and you're you're sitting in front of a, a, a community of global philanthropists 
that are really interested in making sure that the working capital is available to drive change. And we happen to be one of these, what I think is really unique moments, particularly in this space. And I'd be interested to know from, um, f from all of you, where, where do you think the, the investment capital, if we can put it that way, that's represented in this room is best used uh, in the future for us to really be able to drive the kind of change that we're seeing take place already? Yeah, I, I just just um, riffing off of Nina's statement. You know, the idea of sustainability and, and all the tools and ideas that are being brought forth from this panel and our, our other colleagues. We want to make tools that will scale, and we can't scale them as nonprofits ourselves. We can bring them to market. They need to be adopted and then run by quote unquote the decision makers. So if you take the title of of this entire forum, the the disruptors and decision makers, it's a perfect blending of creating disruptive tools that then become the new normal, and they get scaled by the decision makers that make the world run. We think that is the ecology of change around this issue. So really, for us, we're more of a maker movement when it comes around making change. We're making these ideas that can scale, but we can't be, have our hands on them. Dan can't be doing it all the time. Nina can't be doing it all the time. So these ideas need to be able to be supported, built up such that we can get the will going that the decision makers start to take this on and go, well, yeah, that seems reasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good. Dan. We've seen tremendous movement over the past year within the electronic sector, which is, um, which in their Taiwanese, Malaysian, and Singaporean top tier supply chains have very high risks of slavery. The, the companies that are making the displays on your cell phones and the circuit, pro circuit boards and the processors. And we've seen progress because we were funded by the Department of Labor to do a multi-year study of the, the very deep investigation that really quantified the number of people in a condition of forced labor in those top tier supply chains and the reasons that they were in there in those conditions. And that mobilized us to be able to move from the one company that we've been working with very intensively to two, and now to the entire sector that has changed its, its essentially a key aspect of its, of its sectoral policy towards corporate citizenship. Evidence of the trajectory that, uh, that, that, can, that can happen in a fairly short period of time if the information is in the right place, in the right hands, and is compelling enough. And so certainly one place that the philanthropic sector needs to pay attention to is, is in providing that information information at a detailed and compelling enough level, at which point companies become the, 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 the element of sustainability. If, if, they adopt, if they change their policies and change their practices, the whole model then can carry on because they've integrated it. They've, they've essentially reintegrated this element of responsibility in a very outsourced economic system, and we don't have to pay for that over time. Um, but I will also say that Nina's, I'm on Nina's board. I think philanthropists should give money to Nina. <laughs> Isn't that the kind of board member you We're want? We're going to renew the term now. <laughs> <laughs> Proven my worth. Um, you know, it's an interesting question because, you know, I deal with fundraising every single day of the year, and um, the reality of it is, is that philanthropists have a range of interests, and um, it's not always easy to rally everyone together around the same thing. And I think there's a lot to fund in this space right now. There's some, I think the key is to focus on where there's an evidence base, where there's some proven um, models that have worked out there, and there are opportunities to get in and fund efforts that are supporting victims of slavery in the global economy, um, scalable business models like ours. Um, um, community development initiatives that are happening, uh, especially in India. There's a lot going on. I think what's interesting, getting to Justin's point about scaling, is that we're starting to see, and I know Dan and I talked about this um, the other day, that the governments in the countries where we're working are starting to take a much stronger interest all of a sudden. For example, um, you know, we've been working in Nepal, I guess, on the ground for about 17 years, and we've mostly had a, a decent relationship with the labor ministry and others, um, and sometimes not so decent. Um, but, but you know, the labor department there is not doing these inspections that need to happen, and therefore we're there now. Good, we've 
long term should not be doing that. The government of Nepal should. It, it's interesting, not long after um, an article that came out in The Guardian about um, the problems in the carpet industry in Nepal, they were, um, it created a lot of waves and questions and we were blamed for this and it was, it was, um, it was a, there was a big uproar. And then all of a sudden the labor department did a raid and a carpet um, production site. And, you know, it's so interesting. It's like after 17 years, you're finally doing this instead of kind of resisting. And what they did is they took 15 children that they found in a, um, in a carpet factory to our rehabilitation center and said, here, deal with this. And so it's just, it's interesting because it's a sign that actually they are paying attention and that in some ways maybe it's the early days of, of the government starting to support and adopt the strategy that we have and, and, and that's what we need to have happen, right? So I think um, one of the things I've been thinking about is how do we create more incentives and I think there's a role for philanthropists in this for governments to create a, an influential dialogue with the government of Nepal, for example, to say, hey, we're a group of philanthropists, we want to invest in economic development here, um, and we, um, we would like you also to work with us and the civil society here to develop um, legislation, incentives for the businesses in your country to have good practices. You know, so right now we have a group of Nepalese um, carpet producers who are doing the right thing, but they're right now they're having to compete in a very tough business environment against those that are using a lot of forced labor and child labor to produce their goods. What about it? The government um, stepped in and said, hey, here there are some trade incentives here for those of you who are um, doing good business. So I think there's some really interesting ways to help spur that. I want to follow up on that in a moment, but Stella, you've got some comments on this. I uh, no, I, I think this is an extremely important point. I was interviewing the finance minister from Sierra Leone, and he used a phrase which has stuck with me is, you in the West have so many underutilized resources, lawyers, professionals who have, are retired, and they have expertise that we need. Send us your underutilized resources. We lack technical capacity to do this type of work. So I don't know anybody who's tapping that resource. There's many people who would like to do things like figure out how the supply chain works and how a con country can be more responsible as well as the company. I'm not real, I painted myself into the anti-company role. I'm not really that. So that, number one, I think technical capacity of countries is very, very important in providing more support for that. Um, the other point, which I'm sure you'll get back to, uh, I do think that there has to be much more, um, less enthusiasm around data, more critical usage of data. Yes, there's lots more that can be done, uh, and I think it's critical because social audits have a limited role um, because of all the corruption that can get associated with how they're actually implemented. We haven't really figured out how to very effectively use data. <coughs> and most critically on that, from a lot of the reporting I've done around how data collection has been used um, to, for monitoring purposes around the world, is there's an intermediary role. You collect the data, but then who's using it? And who's the advocate who then says, whoa, there's a real problem here and goes to the government and um, lobbies for change or goes to the corporation. So it's not just the collection and creating of all these real super cool tools, but you know, as Justin said, he's then going to the company and saying, here's something you didn't know. And even better, if you can go to them and say, here's something you didn't know, but this is also what you can do about it. So that intermediary role of how to connect the actors with the uh, victims is a very important part of the pie. Well, Dan, we're, we're actually we're doing some work with you on this issues around data, both quantity and quality. So, what what what's your reflections on that? Uh, it, it, it needs to be gathered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the their high level risk based data, such that we can point to places where problems likely exist, is I think available and has been captured and made available by Justin and others. I think data that connects individual specific business partners in a supply chain, suppliers, farms, factories, labor brokers, 
that data does not yet exist in a credible manner, so the work that we're doing with Humanity United is intended to focus in particular on identifying um, the labor brokers who essentially facilitate the debt bonded migration of workers from one country to another, uh, in, uh, at the end of which they end up in a condition of modern day slavery or, or severe exploitation. And we believe if we, can, if we can create a data set around that and really map it using data that companies already have, which is limited, information that we gather, data that we gather ourselves, and then publicly available data, which is often exists but has not yet been captured, like is a labor broker de-licensed for corruption in the Philippines? That information may exist on the Philippines Overseas Employment Administration website, but it's never been brought into this corporate responsibility supply chain conversation. So we're trying to do that. And we have hope that that will then provide companies not just with a place where they have to uh, sort of understand risk differently, but actually specific business partners they can either favor or or um, or move away from. Good, good. I have more questions, but I want to be sensitive that we wanted to open this up for Q&A from the audience members as well. So uh, why don't we shift to that? And if you have a question, if I could ask you to raise your hand and actually just uh, introduce yourself and ask your question, and then we'll move to that. So the gentleman here in the front table, if you wouldn't mind, we have a microphone coming, and introduce yourself and ask the question. Uh, I'm Virgilio Viana from uh, Brazil, from the Amazon. Welcome. And I'd like to bring a perspective from a region which has not been touched so far in the forum, which is the Amazon. Uh, Manaus, which is the capital city of the state of Amazonas, has a huge electronics industry, produces most Brazilian cell phones, uh, motorcycles, watches, and other goods. And lots of those goods come uh, or are built with parts coming from China and other parts of the world. And I don't know of any study uh, that has looked into the slavery component of, of, this, of these supply chains. Would be curious to know. Um, I would also like to, to take a point that Dan mentioned, uh, the, the challenge of going beyond the disasters. Uh, into something which is more structural. And for a non-expert on modern age slavery like me, I would benefit from having a sort of a simple toolkit, a simple approach, solutions type, that uh, one could, with the least uh, effort possible, find ways to, to move in this uh, agenda. So it occurred to me that uh, there is a very interesting initiative led by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, which is called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and I happen, uh, which is being led by Jeffrey Sachs, and uh, uh, I'm a, a co-chair of this on forests, nothing related to, to slavery directly. So it occurred to me that maybe that would be an interesting platform for you experts on this to display these solutions so that this become available to all parties who are interested in, okay. in this. Okay, so there was a question in there. Does anybody want to pick that up? around the, the development of toolkits yeah, and sure. ways in which people who aren't acquainted with this might draw closer to it. Well, I'll mention, I'll mention one toolkit that currently exists. It's a company called SAP. Um, we just recently partnered with SAP because they are pushing towards this concept of the networked economy. So how can we start understanding they've got a whole entire set of toolkits for their 1.7 million companies on their network, which there's upwards of 60% of global GDP goes through their technology on a daily basis. So they're seeing transaction happen all over the place. They have a very genuine, real interest, and we're partnering with them to start to get optics on those supplier networks. Who's buying from who? What's going which way? And what are the value sets that are going from one supplier to another? So if, one, if a buyer has values around this issue, but they want to buy from suppliers that have those same values, SAP is helping us connect the dots on those. Now, now that's the network. Think of that as the real estate. The data goes on top of that, right? So the data has to go into every one of those suppliers to get a sense of who is actually caring about this and what are their policies and all the rest of it. That is before us. That's the world we actually live in and that's the world that we can take where we can start leveraging networks that already exist. I think a lot of the frustration that we get or we feel is that we're constantly building things and we have a very strong desire not to recreate the wheel. None of us up here want to recreate the wheel. So I think there's plenty of real estate, like you're saying, you give an example, to start to take some of these ideas is and some of these tools and bogart them into existing scalable practices. Good. 
uh, on our website is a, is a toolkit. If you are a business that is hiring people through third-party labor brokers, we tell you how to make sure that slavery does not result. And I love the idea of finding new mechanism systems networks into which that existing information, which has been adopted by hundreds of companies at this point, finds new purchase in new in pl people, folks who haven't seen it yet. Thank you for the suggestion. Right down front here. Yvonne Moore from the Disney Hauser Family Foundation in New York. Question about the ground roots, uh, ground, uh, grassroots rather. And actually, thank you so much for that website. I shared slave, uh, shared that with <laughs> friends, and it was actually a startling mm. to Sorry. all of us how we are involved in the supply chain. But to reporting, this is a little bit lower than you know high level. But is there a phone number, website, text, anything that people can report if they're identifying it in their communities? Um, we work mostly with community-based organizations, so I'm wondering if they, you know, the keys for identifying slavery, if they're interacting, especially with young people, to your point, because we work in Liberia, so if they're identifying this Blair. trend starting, and then how can they report it safely? Mm. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Polaris. Yeah. You text to, I think you text Be Free and the oh, yeah. phone number attached to it, but if you go to Polaris' website, they are the, you, the national hotline, anti-trafficking hotline in the United States. It's a wonderful organization. Good, good. And they have been rolling out globally, Thanks. too. Yeah, try. Yeah. Yeah. We had a question uh, directly back here at the middle table. Hi, good morning. My name is Mary. I'm from Brazil, a company named Pupa, and we work with early childhood, so I'm quite interested in um, children's slavery. Um, but my question is, uh, and it's my perception that things are too much divided into, uh, and I think uh, pretty much the role of the private sector, that we produce wealth uh, and we have the stock market, which is very important. On the other side, part of this profit is redirected to, to the third sector, trying to help the problems that somehow the private sector has created itself. So I was wondering if you guys have tried to work on a special label for companies that are inherent complying with social um, in the stock market. So we could identify these champions and we could try to, try to have a structural change on how we invest because we are now creating impact investing, trying to build up champions on social and profit, but we are not working with existing companies that could be identified and rewarded by ordinary investors that would show to the market that this is the way we want to reward companies that are complying with social mm -hmm. uh, requirements as well. So my question is how we are working I with that. that. Thank you. I think, Nina, you've got something to say about that. Well, I've, I mean, that's a really interesting idea. And I, um, I, I don't know of any efforts. Do you happen to know? Of, OK. So um, I mean, I would just say that um, my observation of the impact investing space from afar is that there's a big emphasis on job creation and not as much on are those sustainable jobs? Are how are workers being treated? And you know that there, I would, I think there are incredible opportunities for partnership um, between impact investors and groups like ours who are inside of supply chains, looking and verifying um, working conditions in the companies um, that are that are the the ones to invest in from a social standpoint. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, collaboration around there. Um, and I, I think it's a great and complicated idea, but I think Dan may know more about what's been happening. I agree with you that it's very difficult for anyone outside a company to have an accurate read on what's going on inside the company. The reporting that companies do tends not to address the kind of deep level that we're talking about. But the, the B Lab or the Benefit Corporation movement here in the United States uh, I think only two registered B Corps are public companies at this point, so you don't have a lot of equity investment opportunities, but it's an initiative that is gaining real traction both legally and in, and in, in the corporate community to figure out how to intersect environmental and social disclosure and conditions in, in the corporate structure. So it's worth looking into, I think. The, there was in Southern Africa a move, and I've not kept up this, it was a couple of years ago, to launch a stock exchange which was exclusively for companies that met certain social criteria with specifically that aim that there's many, many people who would like to buy equity in them but don't know how to uh, identify them. I haven't kept up with how it went, but I think it's an interesting example. 
I'm good. Good. Any other questions that I'm missing here in the back table on my left? Uh, if you would stand up and introduce yourself, we have a microphone coming to you. Thanks, and thanks for the panel. Um, I'm Shamina Singh with the MasterCard. Um, I'm really glad that you brought up um, SAP and uh, what they were doing around networks, because I think there is uh, this moment where uh, corporate objectives are actually aligning with uh, other objectives now that could be socially responsible. And so to the extent that Target, SAP, and others are thinking about this, I think it's actually very interesting. Um, and so that's why I wanted to sort of offer up, because we're also working with um, SAP, but the notion of uh, electronifying supply chains, it won't, it doesn't solve sort of the values-based fight and, the, and, and that kind of conversation. But I think what it does do is it aligns the corporate profit objectives with uh, actually making the world a better place. Um, and so to the extent that if you digitize a supply chain, meaning if you pull cash out of the supply chain, like Coca-Cola is doing in Latin America, where literally the trucks are um, digitizing and saying the Coca-Cola supplier in point A is electronically paying all the truck drivers and the bottlers and things like that and pulling cash out so that those truck stops stop becoming places of um, slavery, prostitution, drugs, because they're literally pulling cash out of the supply chain. It's another way to think about um, aligning some of the objectives. And again, it doesn't solve the values debate. That's a different conversation. But to the extent that uh, there, there are other technology, technological opportunities that, that are out there that are currently being considered, I think is actually very interesting. Great. Thank you. That's, great. That's very good. I think we saw another question over here to the right, this gentleman uh, right here. Uh, I'm John Saul from Saul Family Foundation. Uh, I have kind of a two-part question. First part is that I heard here of so many organizations that are on the subject. For example, in the Economist article about a month ago, they named uh, the Legatum Foundation and the Global Freedom Network, and three other foundations all started by Andrew Forrest, Global Fund and Slavery, Freedom Fund, <coughs> and Walk Free, plus all the organizations that you represent. I don't think the Economist article mentioned any of your organizations, but all of a sudden I'm faced with a dozen organizations. How do I sort them out? And which ones are going to really uh, lead the pack? Also, second part of the question is I don't hear certification as a big word uh, when you think of the environmental uh, responsibility, there's all sorts of certifications. There's the Forest Stewardship Council, the Aquaculture mm -hmm. Stewardship yeah. Council, the Marine Stewardship Council, and they offer, all offer a brand that you can put on your product uh, to indicate that there's a chain of custody system that has ensured that this product is, is free from certain abuses. Yeah. Yeah. So how come I'm not hearing that word and help me sort out? Well, we, I, think, uh, I think we have uh, four people that will uh, talk to you about that word quite a bit here. But also, I think if, if it was a Thomson Reuters article, it would have been more accurate. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm afraid The Economist reported because there were some inaccuracies in that piece <laughs> and some organizations apparently Parenthetically, Humanity United that were left out of that, but uh, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, Stella, talk to us about the reporting on this and and how can we continue to uh, improve the quality of it and the accuracy? Ooh. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little about what we do. Um, the Thomson Reuters Foundation has a website which covers human rights issues, and trafficking is a, 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 an area that we have a very particular interest in. Um, actually doing really good in-depth investigative reporting, because that's what it requires to track where there's slavery and actually go to uh, the locations, interview the people who are uh, threatened by their employers if they're seen talking to other people, and then to verify that things really have gone wrong is extremely time-consuming, and it's actually can be quite risky as well. Um, so that's why you're not seeing as much reporting in that space as you would like to. I, for instance, there was a big report on palm oil that um, our competitor Bloomberg ran a, year, a couple of years ago. Um, I have it on good authority that that cost 200000 to do that report and took over a year to complete it. Similarly, we did a report on the Rohingya Muslims who were being um, chased out of Myanmar in, uh, on fishing boats over to Thailand and down into Malaysia. And, and 
and um, you know locked in camps. Uh, that was six nine months of reporting. We were very fortunate. We had a reporter who is Burmese who was able to get us access there, um, and we did one on Pulitzer for it as well. <laughs> Um, but it's, this takes huge amounts of time and significant investments of money. So that's why you don't see as much in-depth reporting as we would like. Certainly we want to, and we yeah. do work on it, but it's uh, it, it actually, it, it I needs think help, needs a, support. We'll, we'll turn to the certification one, and we're drawing down to the last few seconds. But I think there's an interesting session in the future, GPF, around the role of philanthropy in journalism mm -hmm. and the changing marketplace for philanthropy, but the importance uh, that journalism plays for for so many of the particular issues that we work on. Yeah, just one other thing we are doing is we do train journalists in developing countries in order to build their skills as well, yeah. uh, which I think is an, an extremely important area because right. unless it's, you can't have it all done by the, the privileged West. It's got to be buttoned up too. Perfect. Okay, this little timer is about to start flashing red, and but we want to get to the certification uh, question quickly here and uh, try to address this. Yeah, um, so uh, I probably wasn't doing my job well enough, but I did make clear that our organization does do certification and we're in a, um, we are aligned with a group of organizations like the ones you mentioned. We all are um, part of a, a similar, co uh, the same coalition that um, we work under to ensure credible certification. And I think that's the key. So um, we're working in the carpet industry, but now we're looking at how do we expand into new sectors and bring credible certification into new sectors around the issues of slavery that we work on. Um, but that's also very expensive labor intensive work and I think we need to think about using it selectively in sectors where it's really you know essential to, to have that as the tool and the solution. Perfect. Anybody else on can, this? Can I come in? Yeah, the, the, the certification schemes that you mentioned that Nina's also in this coalition with have are, are, are certifying something that's not easy, but easier to measure than what we're talking about. So when we go into factories or so places in Malaysia where we did this work to gather information from Burmese and Nepali workers, they were they felt incredibly vulnerable to come out of their factory compounds to talk to us because there's a militia there that essentially accosts them, steals their passports, and threatens them with deportation. In order for us to interview Burmese and Nepali migrants in those locations, we have to bring in Burmese and Nepali interviewers who are equally at risk when they're there. We can't stay in one location for more than an hour trying to collect information from workers and interview them. So the, the process of measuring such that you could comfortably certify is very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, and I just, I just say we live in the 21st century now where some of the, the methodologies that we've created to quote unquote certify and, and verify, um, some of those now need to grow into the 21st century and need to be thinking about how we're doing purchases in the future and not just what just happened in the past. So I think some of our models for the way that we define what good is are even being disrupted as well. Perfect. Well, listen, um, this has been a terrific panel and I believe all four of you will be here through the rest of the day. And so I know that they'll be available to speak with. I'm afraid we're going to have to close. But before I ask you to, to show your thanks for the panel, I'm going to ask you also to remain seated as I introduce the next speaker who will be coming up in a few minutes on the stage immediately after this plenary. Marcus Bleasdell is a documentary photographer who spent nearly a decade covering the brutal conflict within the borders of the DRC. We're going to hear from him and uh, look through some of, see some of his extraordinary photographs. And it's a case study of slavery in the conflict mineral trade in the DRC. But before Marcus comes on up to the stage, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you very much indeed. Um, what a fantastic panel that was. Um, First of all, thank you to the forum for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to talk uh, to you about uh, the work that I've done in the DRC, Central African Republic, in, and Central Africa in general. My name is Marcus Bleasdale, and I'm a photographer, and I work for National Geographic magazine and an organization called Human Rights Watch. And right now is a very exciting time for visual storytellers like me. Uh, Technology has revolutionized photography. 
uh, both on how photographers work and also how we use and relate to photographs. It's led to new distribution networks, Instagram, YouTube, Vimeo, to name just a few, and all this connection broadens the potential reach of images in staggering ways. But there's a Faustian bargain at play here. The very devices that allow us to do what we do, to allow you to do what you're all doing right now, have a price, and the children in the Democratic Republic of Congo have been paying that for the last 10 years. Extraction of conflict minerals to use in our electronic devices has fueled the conflict, and over the past 15 years, many millions have died as a result. In fact, so many people have died in Congo since 1998 that it equates to the whole population of the Washington DC metropolitan area. 5.4 million people since 1998 have died in the conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The war is forcing children to pick up a gun and fight. These children here you see are 14, 15 years old, and they're protecting a gold mine around the town of Bavi for a warlord called Cobra Matata. This boy is 11 and was fighting for the Congolese government side, the group of rebels called the Mai Mai, who believe bullets will drop off them like water. They don't. This girl is fighting for the same rebel group, and that skirt that you can see under her military clothes is her school uniform. All these children are being used by military groups to secure high valuable mining resources that contain gold, tantalum, tungsten, tin, and all of which are being used in our smartphones, tablets, computers, and cameras. When the fighting calms down, the rebels and government forces busy themselves in extracting the minerals for their personal profit, and they use the same children that they force to be child soldiers in the mines to extract what they need. This boy is 14 and is extracting gold from a mine in the town of Pluto, in northeastern Congo. The groups live and work in the mines to extract rock and process these high-value minerals. The conditions are dangerous, and many people die in these mines in eastern Congo from landslides, malaria, typhoid, and other diseases. These rocks are crushed in the mine and processed and smuggled over the borders into neighboring Rwanda, and Uganda, and they are shipped to smelting plants across the globe. There are plants all the way over the globe, but many are in Asia, and most of the minerals end up there to be processed in smelters. From there, they're processed further, and they are then used to make components in our electronic products, which are then shipped out of, to stores around the world, and we buy them. The collective effect of these wars on the people of DRC has been devastating. Over two million people are currently displaced due to fighting, fleeing their homes with basic things that they and their children can carry. They seek sanctuary in displaced camps close to the main cities, and they're forced to build shelters to protect themselves and their families from the sun and the rain. They have very little food, and these camps grow to enormous sizes. As the camps grow, the health situation deteriorates. Sanitation is key, yet it's very difficult to maintain clean water facilities, and cholera is always a big killer when the rainy season arrives. Many of the women who arrive in these camps need to care for their families and children by collecting wood and water, and it's just this moment when the number one weapon of war is used in the DRC, sexual violence. In Congo, Amnesty International reported up to 40,000 reported cases a year in the DRC in the East. According to research conducted by the Journal of American Medical Association in 2010, 39.7% of women in Eastern Congo reported to have been exposed to sexual violence during their lifetime. This image was taken in January 2013, and you can see on the wall the statistics uh, 540 women had been enrolled in the program to help them deal with the after-effects of rape in one town, in one center. 
This was the 28th of January when I took this picture. In 28 days, 540 women had been enrolled in post-rape uh, facilities. The devastating death toll that I mentioned earlier of 5.4 million is not due to the bullet or the gun, but really due to the breakdown in health as a result of the overall insecurity in the region. There are hospitals deep in rebel territory which don't even have an aspirin. People die from preventable diseases every day, and ironically, it's the mineral-rich towns which have the worst security and have the highest death toll. This is a hospital bed in a rebel-controlled town called Bavi. They had no medication at all when I visited there. Life expectancy in Congo is less than 50 years. Congo has the second highest infant mortality rate in the world of 116 deaths per 1,000. The USA has eight. Norway, where I live, has four. Over 85% of the population lives on less than $1.25 a day. According to USAID, 194 out of 1,000 children will not reach the age of five. Nearly 500,000 children in DRC die every year from preventable diseases like malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea. Those are the statistics, but this is the reality. This is the burial of Alexandrine, who died of cholera just outside Goma. These funerals are everywhere. And the worst day I experienced in DRC was when I had to go to 19 children's funerals. In 2010, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Bill was passed into law, which contained a provision that every publicly traded company in the New York Stock Exchange responsible for tracing, was responsible for tracing and reporting if they sourced their material minerals from DRC or its neighbors. Some companies are being very proactive, such as Intel, Motorola Solutions, Philips, who are sponsoring conflict-free mi free mines in, near Bibwe in Eastern Congo. The electronics industry is moving forward, but the jewelry industry still has a lot of work to do to enhance awareness. Two jewelry retailers are starting work on this issue, Signet Jewelers and Tiffany's, but most others are very far behind. But the real challenge is to get all electronics companies and manufacturers and jewelry companies on board and moving forwards towards a conflict-free product by investing in cleaning up the supply chain. Currently, 60% of 200 global smelters have been audited, which is brilliant, but we should aim for 100%. Only a small handful of companies are deliberately sourcing conflict-free minerals from DRC, and that number must go up so that there is a vibrant market for conflict-free minerals from Congo, which will increase the wages for Congolese miners. It's the responsibility of us, the consumers, and you, the manufacturers, of these products to demand that our phones, our tablets, our computers, our jewelry, and the cameras that we use are conflict-free. I'm not advocating not buying them. I'm just advocating only buying those products which we can categorically say have no conflict minerals in them at all. But unfortunately, right now, we cannot say that. We have a collective responsibility to right this wrong, and our industries should rise to that challenge. We have made huge leaps forward in the move towards conflict-free electronics and jewelry in the past five years, and we really have made a huge difference thanks to the vision of organizations like Intel and Apple, but there is still so much more to do. This image sticks with me when I open my tablet, when I use my smartphone, and I hope it sticks with you too, and I hope that you will help us work together towards conflict-free, conflict-mineral-free products. Thank you very much.